but that's very common to do that where there's extra scriptures in there that you can go and read about each different point and different things. So I want to encourage that's there. There's lots of other things in the app that are beneficial to you too, the announcements and links and all kinds of stuff. Uh, you can scroll through all the messages that we've that are in the bank there um, and go back a couple years. So I uh, just want to encourage you to do that. All right. In his book, The Grip of Grace, Max Licato writes this. I'm glad the letter wasn't sent from heaven. It came from my automobile insurance company. My former auto insurance company, that is. I didn't drop them, they dropped me. Not because I didn't pay my premiums, I was on time and caught up. And not because I failed to do the paperwork, every document was signed and delivered. I was dropped for making too many mistakes. The letter began by politely telling me that my record had been under review. It read, we have secure motor vehicle records which indicate a speed violation in December and in January and a not at fault accident by your wife in December. Additional records indicate another speeding violation in April. Now, I'm the first to admit we tend to have a little bit of heavy footed uh, and, and careless. In fact, that's the reason why we have insurance, right? Aren't the blemishes on my record an indication I'm a worthy client? (laughs) Wasn't the whole insurance business invented for people like me? My initial thought was what the company was writing to congratulate me on being such a good customer. Maybe they were waiting to uh, invite me to a banquet or tell me that I've won an award. But the letter continued. Our records indicate that on November 18th, we paid to fix damage on another vehicle that backed into another car in a parking lot. The twofold appearance of the word another alarmed me. Perhaps I need to urge them to read 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love keeps no records of wrongs. (laughs) The letter continued, in view of the above information, we're not willing to reinstate your automobile insurance policy. The policy will terminate at 12.01 a.m. Standard Time, January 4th. You are urged to obtain other insurance to prevent any lapse in coverage. Now, wait a minute. Let me see if I get this straight. I bought insurance to cover my mistakes, but then I get dropped for making too many mistakes. Hello? Did I miss something? Did I fail to see a footnote? Did I skip some fine print in the contract? Isn't that like a doctor treating healthy patients only? Or a dentist hanging up a sign in the window, no cavities, please? (laughs) Isn't that like qualifying for a loan by proving you don't need a loan? What if, or what if, perish the thought, heaven had limitations on its coverage? What if you got a letter from the Pearly Gate Underwriting Division? (laughs) That's horrible theology, but just, just, just go with it. (laughs) that read, Dear Mrs. Smith, I am writing in response to this morning's request for forgiveness. I am sorry to inform you that you have reached your quota of sins. Our records show that since employing our services, you have veered seven times in the area of greed, and your prayer life is substandard when compared to others of like age and circumstance. Further review reveals that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20 percentile, and you have an excess tendencies to gossip, Because of your sins, you are a high-risk candidate for heaven. Jesus sends his regrets and his kindest regards and hopes that you will find some other form of coverage. Many fear receiving such a letter, and some worry they already have. If an insurance company can't cover my honest mistakes, can God be expected to cover my intentional mistakes? This morning, Luke chapter 5 answers that question. The answer is yes. Now, but let's open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to continue in our study of the book of Luke. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we thank you that your grace is greater than our sin, that all our sin, all sin was laid on you at the cross. Lord, and you took it all. Lord, we thank you, and we praise you. Now, Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And Lord, we pray that your word, the scriptures, would fall on the good soil of our hearts and that it would take deep root 
And then it would grow strong and tall and bear much fruit for your glory to build your kingdom and to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. We'll re- let's read it, and then we'll, we'll go through it. All right? Starting in verse 17, it says this. One day, as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. So in verse 20, there's a phrase I'd like to draw your attention to. It's where Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And that's the message of this miracle and the story that follows it. Jesus forgives sin and calls us friend. Jesus forgives sin and calls us friend. In fact, the title of today's message is Friend, Your Sins Are Forgiven. Friend, Your Sins Are Forgiven. We're in Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26. Now, as we make our way through this passage, there's three words, three words that we're going to hang our thoughts on today. The first word is the word faith. The word faith, and we'll be in verses 17 through 20 for this one. Look at it. It says this, starting in verse 17. One day, as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. Now, at this point, Jesus has been ministering in Judea and Galilee for about 18 months, almost about a year and a half. And during that time, he's worked an incredible number of miracles. He has become famous because of his teachings. Crowds follow him because of his miracles. I mean, they're hanging on his words. Jesus can now draw a crowd of thousands if he just stops long enough in one place, right? So so there are those in the religious establishment uh, who are concerned. They've heard talk about him. They've heard about him, and now they want to hear him for themselves. So it says Pharisees and teachers of the law came from Every village in Galilee. That is astounding. Every village in Galilee. There's over 200 of them. And so they come, and they're coming from Jerusalem and Judea. They're coming, it says. So now, who are the Pharisees? Well, this is Luke's first mention of them in the book of Luke. And if you're a reader of the Gospels, you're going to see this term used very frequently, Pharisees. So kind of who are they? So let me give you a kind of a brief idea who they are. And, and within the confines of Judaism, there were four different groups, four different groups. First, there were the Zealots. The Zealots, they were the nationalists. They were, the Jews who, they were the Jews who wanted to revolt against Rome. Remember, the Roman Empire had conquered that area of the world, and they were Jews who wanted to revolt against Rome and the Roman Empire, and they were a politically motivated group. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples uh, was from the Zealots, Simon the Zealot. There were two Simons, Simon called Peter and Simon who was a zealot. He came from there. That was his background, but became one of the 12. Then there were the Essenes, and they were a monastic community. They moved out of the city, uh, out of civilization. They were more like a separatist group, and they prided themselves on focusing primarily on the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then there were the Sadducees, Three, three, and the Sadducees were primary, the priestly class, the Jewish nobles, the nobility, 
and the politically influential. Religiously, the Sadducees would be considered the liberals of their day. They did not believe in necessarily a literal interpretation of Scripture, and uh, they aligned themselves with Rome, and certainly they didn't believe in the supernatural. The Sadducees did not believe in the supernatural. They, to the, to that means they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in resurrection. So when Jesus is, is doing all these miracles, got, there's some other explanation. They, they just did not believe in the supernatural at all. Now, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then heaven is off the table. So that's why they were sad, you see. Yeah. That's for you, buddy. There you go. You like those. Okay. If you don't believe that God is personally involved in your life, it's a sad state of affairs. It really is. And then fourth, there were the Pharisees, and, uh, whose chief concern was keeping and promoting the law of Moses. That was their chief concern. And they, they have pretty much reduced religious life to rituals and rules, uh, boil it all down to a bunch of to-dos and to-don'ts, and they hear of Jesus, and now they're coming to check out his teaching for themselves. Then in verse 17, it says, And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Now, what that is telling us is that Jesus did not heal at will, right? He only healed at those times and those moments when he knew that the Father was empowering him to do that. And so this is one of those times, and Luke wants us to know that. Right? As Jesus is teaching there, he's in a house. Most scholars believe it's Peter's house, Simon Peter's house. The book of Mark tells us in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, that it was in the town of Capernaum. And in verse 2, it says that so many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and Jesus preached the word to them. Remember, they're coming from every village of Galilee. There's a lot of people here. Now, let me just kind of explain the setting. The typical house in that day were not big like houses today are. Even small houses today would be big in comparison, but un unless you were nobility or uh, they were not, the houses then were not grand, they were not impressive. They would just be a couple of very small rooms, really small rooms uh, on the first level, and then the roof would be flat, and then there would be an outside stairway that would go up alongside uh, of, of the house to get up on the roof. And sometimes they would build a room up on the roof, and sometimes they would leave it open like a patio area. Uh, uh, different people would do different things. But here's this large crowd. It's not hard to imagine. The streets are narrow. The houses are small and compact. And if there are hundreds of people there, they, they're, they're crammed into the house, uh, and they're spilling out into the streets. Okay, so everybody got that visual in your mind. In Mark chapter 2, verse 3, it says that some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. So here's a man, he's paralyzed, and it's a group of men, not just four men, it's a group of men, friends of the paralytic. It just happens that four of them are carrying him, but there's a group, and we don't know how many, none of the gospel writers tell us that, but here comes in addition to all these people that are already crammed there, listening to Jesus' teaching, here comes another group of people, four of them carrying a paralyzed man. Now back to Luke 5, verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. So here's this group carrying someone who is paralyzed on a mat. We don't know how he was paralyzed. Could have been the result of a fall neck injury, a back injury, could have been the result of disease, polio, MS, we don't know. But imagine what it would have been like for him, this paralyzed man. I want you to put yourself in the place of this paralyzed man because, I mean, it's hard enough in our day with medical science and technology, but to have that kind of physical disability in that day uh, would have had some extra challenges for sure. Not only would there be the physical hardship, but there would be the social stigma attached to it because the common conclusion in that day, in that culture, was if you were sick, it was because you were sinful. If you even got the flu, I mean, anything, any type of sickness was directly related, oh, there's sin in your life, right? That was the common thinking, that was the common everything in that day, in that culture. So everywhere this guy is, People are wondering, what is it he's done to deserve where he's at? That's the common thought, and he knows people are thinking that. I mean, could you imagine? 
Just everywhere you go, everybody's thinking, what's wrong with you? What did you do? You know, how angry did you make God, right? All this stuff, that stigma is always on him. And, and, then, and then even the disciples, even the disciples in John chapter 9, verse 1 through 3, they saw a blind man and they said to Jesus, who sinned, this man's parents or, or this man or his parents that he was born blind? Like, who sinned? And Jesus says, neither. Stop thinking like that. Don't think like that. So this paralyzed man grew up with that kind of thinking and suffered not only the stigma of being disabled, but also from an overwhelming sense that he was sinful. Because if you grew up and everybody was like, that was the common thought, he must have thought, I am, yeah, it's because of that. And so, and maybe he himself felt that and therefore was responsible for his own physical condition. On a side note, very, very side note, the Bible does teach that there is some sickness that is sin-related. But that's not what's going on here. Okay, verse 19. When they could not find a way, okay, they could not find a way to get him in front of Jesus, so his friends have heard about Jesus' healing ability, and maybe they heard a testimony personally from somebody. Capernaum, not a huge city in that day, probably a town of about 5,000 people. So, uh, so, so, uh, so they know if they can just get him in front of Jesus, Jesus will heal him. They know if we can just get him in front of Jesus, Jesus can help him. And when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. They went up on the roof. Now, what they would, uh, uh, so they go up the stairway on the side of the house, and they go up onto the roof of the house, which is a flat surface, remember, and they carry him up there, and it says, and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. So Jesus is standing in the middle of one of these rooms. And what they would do is, uh, how they build their houses is they would use arches throughout a room. And they don't have wooden beams. There's not much wood there in Israel. Uh, it's, everything's made out of stone. And so you have these stone beams, stone arches, and there's a series of arched walls with opening that uh, then across that would be these large stone blocks. I mean, they're huge. And, and they would go across, spanning between the two arches, and that would be the roof. And so if they're going to lower him through the roof, uh, then they're going to have to get up there. They're going to have to dig through the plaster. I don't know if they had any tools or they're bare hand in it, but they got to dig through the plaster. They're going to have to uh, uh, have, they have to get under each of these big granite beams, and they're going to have to move them. And then they got to go through the tiles. I mean, this is not a simple operation. I mean, this took some time, too. This is going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of determination. This is going to wreck Peter's house. I mean, could you imagine how you feel? You're in there listening to Jesus. All of a sudden, you hear, right? You hear some scratching. You're like, what's going on, you know? And then you start to hear some pounding, and Jesus is teaching, and you're looking around, you know, you're Peter, and you're like, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, little stuff starts kind of flying down, right? And then some more stuff, and then a big chunk, and you're like, what is going on? Andrew, go, go see what's going on outside. Like, what's, what's someone doing to our roof, right? And, the, and then all of a sudden, there's a little hole, and then the hole starts getting bigger, and you can hear people. You know, there's a commotion, and they're talking, and they're yelling, and they're, hey, they're giving directions to one another, and they're pulling up bigger chunks, and the hole's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and everybody's standing there, like, trying to figure out what's going on, right? So this is a great exhibition of faith. They were intent on bringing this man to Jesus. Verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith. Right? When Jesus saw their faith. Now listen, when Jesus saw the intensity that they had to bring someone to him, he honored that. Let me say that again. When Jesus saw the intensity that they had to bring somebody to him, he honored that. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you bringing people to Jesus? Are you bringing people to Jesus? Right? And I want to say, if you've never brought anyone to church, next week is the week to bring them. Because next week, we're talking about the biggest sinner in town and how Jesus makes the biggest sinner in town one of his disciples. And, and, and it's just mind-blowing. So I want to encourage you to, to be inviting people uh, next week and, and all throughout the week, be inviting people to Christ, not just church, but be inviting people to Christ. But do you sense an urgency to do that? 
Do you sense an urgency to bring people to Jesus? Is that urgency there? You know, because people without Christ are in a worse condition than this paralyzed man. Without Christ, we are eternally lost. We are lost and dead in our sins without Christ, and people are in a worse condition. Do we have an urgency to bring people to Jesus? To bring people we don't know, to bring our friends. This, these guys are bringing their friend to Jesus. Like, bringing people to Jesus. Are you trying to bring people to Jesus? Is there an intensity to your faith? Does your faith have an intensity to believe that if I can just get them to Jesus, he'll save them, he'll help them, he'll heal them, right? I mean, Jesus took note of their tenacity. He took note, faith, their tenacity. Now, let me just say this as well. Would you notice that when we read this, and you can read it in all three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's not recorded in John, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this, this is recorded. That all three of them record it. And in all three gospel accounts, Jesus never commends the paralytic's faith. There's no mention of his faith. What moved Jesus, what he responded to, although Jesus can and does respond to a person's faith who is themselves sick, what moved him in this instance was not the paralytic's faith. What moved Jesus was the friend's faith. The faith of his friends. Now let me ask this question. Are we praying and believing for one another? I mean, this is so important to be praying and believing for one another. I pray f and believe for your needs, Chris, and you pray and believe for their needs, and you, Misty's needs, Misty, you pray and believe for Matthew's needs, you pray and believe for their 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 needs, you pray and believe for my needs, right? And then everybody's needs are being prayed for with faith, right? Then everyone's being prayed for in faith. And is it, isn't it easier to pray and believe for someone else's needs other than your own anyway, right? I mean, I, this is, this is, I think this is true for all of us, right? If, if I need something, I pray. I do my best. I'm growing in that. I got a ways to go, but I'm growing in that. I still struggle. You know, God, I know you can, but all this stuff. But you have a request. Oh, I got all faith for you. I know God will do it for you, right? So let's take advantage of that. Let's just pray for one another. And if I'm praying for you and you're praying for me, then we're praying in faith, right? So let's take advantage of that weakness. God can, his power can be displayed in our weakness. So let's use that. Let's pray and believe for one another and watch God answer our prayers for others and other people's prayers for us. How does that sound? Good? Yeah. Sounds good. Now, when we look at the Bible here, it's the friend's faith. They're bringing him. And God is moved when people have faith. So let's be a church filled with praying people, believing for one another. When Jesus sees the paralytic, the book of Matthew tells us, it's not recorded in Luke, but it's recorded in Matthew, Jesus says something to him. He says, take heart, son. When Jesus says the paralytic, he says, take heart, son. And in the Greek, it's the word that means there's nothing to be afraid of. How many people don't come to Jesus or don't come to God because they're afraid, right? And Jesus says, he finally gets in to Jesus, and Jesus, the first thing he says to him, he says, there's nothing to be afraid of. That's quite the opposite of having faith, isn't it? Right? The friends had faith, but the paralytic, he had fear. That's why Jesus had to say, take heart. There's nothing to be afraid of, son. He had fear. What was he afraid of? Well, he's in front of a crowd, He's in front of the religious leaders. He just got lowered through a roof in front of everybody. I mean, this is all happening in public, right? Maybe he's afraid of God's response. Maybe he's afraid of being turned away or rejected. Maybe he's afraid he feels too big of a sinner that God is going to even acknowledge him. They're going to say he's sick because he's got sin in his life. He already knows it. He's expecting it. Like, he's, he's just gearing himself up psychologically to hear because he knows when they're taking him up on the roof, he sees who the crowd is. It's all the religious leaders and teachers from the whole area. 
He knows what they're going to say. He's afraid of what they're going to say. He's afraid. He's, he's afraid of the stigma. He's afraid of his sin, right? Which leads us to the second word, and that word is forgiveness. Forgiveness, verses 20 through 25, starting with verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Do you know what I find so interesting before, before Jesus forgives him, he calls him friend. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Jesus calls him friend before he forgives him. He says, friend, and then forgives him. Jesus views him as a friend. In fact, it's one of Jesus' titles, friend of sinners, Right? Next week, the Pharisees, as a result of this, are going to get so angry they're going to, at Jesus, they're going to say, uh, why do you hang out and eat with tax collectors and sinners? He's the friend of sinners. He's the friend of sinners. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're not walking with God and you know in your heart you're away from God, you need to know that Jesus is the friend of sinners. If he were not, none of us would be saved. If it was, we got to be right with God before he'll save us, well, then we're all hopeless, right? Friend first, then forgiveness. Otherwise, there's no hope for any of us, right? That's the love of God. That's the love of God. Listen, and God wants to be your friend, and God wants a relationship with you, and God wants to work on your behalf. You know, a lot of the times we have the idea, well, if I can just get my life all cleaned up, right, then God will accept me. Then God will help me. If I can get myself all cleaned up, then God will love me. Then God will want me. But no, before you ever do anything, God loves you and God wants to help you and God wants you. Friend, he calls you. He calls you friend. Even before he saves you, he calls you friend. God loves you. In fact, Pastor Brock and I were talking about it this morning. And he, he brought up a great analogy. Can I use it? Okay. Give you props, buddy. Great analogy. He was like, hey, you know, you don't, you don't uh, clean up before you get in the shower, right? Why would you do that, right? I mean, that's the whole point of the shower is to get clean up. You get in the shower, the shower makes you clean, right? And a lot of people have the, this, this idea that if I, if I clean up, which we can't, we can't clean ourselves up before God, right? That if I can clean up, then I go to God, and then he'll make me. No, we go to God. He's the one who makes us clean. That's the whole point of going to God. That's why we come to Jesus, so that he can make us clean. We can't clean ourselves up. We can't do it. You can try, try, try. That's why it's taking you so long. That's why you keep putting it off. That's why you keep putting it off, coming to Jesus, because you just be like, oh, someday I'll just get, you know, I'll just get my life all together. You, we can't, right? You go into the shower to get clean. You come to Jesus. He cleans you right? That's, that's awesome. Sometimes we have the idea, you know, well, in the Old Testament, you know, God was a God of rules, and he had all these rules, and then he decided, you know what? Rules don't work for people, so I'm going to try forgiveness. You know, but that's not it at all. That God has always been a friend of sinners. I'm going to show you. God has always been a friend of sinners. God has always been the one reaching out to people. God has always been the one who forgives. Look at it. He said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Literally, it's dismissed be your sins. Dismissed be your sins. Gone. They're gone. You know, certainly we all need forgiveness. And can I just suggest to you that this is the greatest miracle there is? The healing of the heart, the healing of the sin condition. Salvation is the greatest miracle there is. This man's about to be healed from being paralyzed, but he's getting a, he just got a greater one, right? He just, salvation is the greatest miracle there is. And let me tell you why. Because if God heals your body physically and he cares about our physical needs, but if God heals your body, at best, that's temporary because you're going to still die someday, right? I mean, the statistics on death are really quite impressive. <laughs> one out of one people die. Pretty impressive. That's the way it works. So your physical healing is temporary at best, physically. 
But if Jesus touches you spiritually, this is for eternity. This is for eternity. Forgiveness by God is the most incredible miracle. The amazing thing about God's forgiveness is that when he forgives, he sends sin far away. Look at it, Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west. How far is that? How far is the east from the west? That's pretty far, right? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins and transgressions from us. The prophet Micah wrote, you hurl our inequities into the depths of the sea. He's not saying they're literally in the depths of the sea, but it's an analogy. They're gone. They're irretrievable. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, the Lord says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. I will remember their sins no more. That's how God forgives. God didn't just start forgiving in the New Testament. I want to, I want, these, these are Old Testament verses. I want you to realize this is Old Testament I'm, I'm, we're talking about right now. God didn't just start forgiving in the New Testament. The New Testament, what Jesus did, made it possible, but God's heart has always been to forgive. These verses are the Old Testament. God wants to forgive you, and he offers it to you, and he says, friend, here it is. Do you want it? Jesus says, friend, here it is. Do you want it? You know, some missionaries were taking the gospel to the Eskimos, and they wanted to translate the gospel, but there's no word in the Eskimo language for forgiveness. Now, how do you tell the gospel to people? I mean, the essence of the gospel is forgiveness, right? When it comes to the kingdom of, of heaven and God, forgiveness is what it's about, right? So how would you tell the gospel to people, to somebody, if, they, if you couldn't say the word forgive? So the missionaries, they prayed about it, and the Holy Spirit pointed them out to a word. They found the Eskimos had a very interesting word. It's one word. It was, here's the word, isuma je ju jun nin er namuk. I think that's close. Sorry if you speak. I, I did my best. This is, it looks like it'd be a very hard language to learn, much harder than French in high school. So. Uh, uh, but do you know what that word means in the Eskimo language? Not being able to think about it anymore. Not being able to think about it anymore. Isn't that what forgiveness is? When God forgives you, he's not able to think about it anymore. Yes. Forgotten. Wiped out. Erased. Cast into the depths. Removed as far as the east is from the west. No longer held against you. When God forgives, he doesn't think about it anymore. It doesn't matter what you've done. When he forgives sin, he removes sin. That is so wonderful. That's the best. Aren't you glad that he does? Come on, church family. Let's just thank the Lord that he removes our sin. Thank you, Paul. And when we speak of God forgiving our sin, it's God removing our sin and not remembering it anymore. It's no longer held against you. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Who aren't walking after the ways of the world. We're walking after the, the ways of the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven, and that created a fury, okay? Because remember who the crowd is, right? They get mad when Jesus does miracles for some reason. Verse 21, a lot of them are jealous. A lot of them are, there's a lot of reasons. But verse 21, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You want to know something? They were right. Only God can forgive sin. And so what's going to happen is Jesus is going to prove that he's God, and he's going to do it two ways. First, he's going to prove that he's God because he can forgive sin, and he's going to prove that he can forgive sin by healing the man. Okay? Second, he's going to prove that he's God because he can read their minds. God knows what they are thinking. Psalm 139 verse 2 says, God, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a thought coalesces in our mind, God knows it. Before you say a word, God knows it. God knows what's in our heart. We can't hide it from him. He knows all things. He knows all things about all things. He knows all things actual and possible. He knows all things. 
1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel the prophet, the Lord looks at the heart. Jeremiah 17, 10, God says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. God searches the heart. He knows what's going on inside of you. You can't hide it from him. You can't fool him, right? That's why it's just better to be honest with God, right? I remember when I finally got honest with God. I was 17 years old, and I was like, God, I'm angry at you. And we had a good talk, and that was a breakthrough moment for me. It was just awesome, because God already knew that. Why was I hiding it? He knew it. I knew it. Let's get it out in the open so that I can be healed. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 5, God says, I know what's going through your mind. God knows everything, and because Jesus is God, he knew exactly what they were thinking. Look at it, verse 22 and 23. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Not because he didn't know, but he wanted them to say it, right? Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk, okay? Jesus says which is easier, okay? Now, you answer the question. You answer the question, which is easier for Jesus, to forgive a soul or to heal a body? Which one caused Jesus less pain, providing this man with health or providing this man with heaven? To heal the man's body took a simple command. To forgive the man's sin took Jesus' blood. The first was done in a house of friends, the second on a hill with thieves. One took a word, the other took a life. Which is easier? Do you know what the irony is here? The Pharisees were stuck. They were stuck. Neither is easier. Both are impossible for men. A man can't heal a paralytic and a man can't forgive someone's sin against God. Both are impossible. The Pharisees are stuck here. They could not legitimately say one was easier than the other. And what's so interesting is their own theology told them that the one who could heal sickness could forgive sin. So when Jesus says in verse 23, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk, in effect, what Jesus is saying is, if I can do one, I can do the other. All right? And notice, Jesus isn't just asking which is easier to do. He's really asking which is easier to say. Right? Because you can go around, a person can go around all day long and say, your sins are forgiven. Right? Right? Sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. How would anybody know? Right? How would anybody know if the sins are actually forgiven or not? Only God sees the heart. Only God sees what's inside somebody's heart, right? But it's not so easy to walk over to somebody who's paralyzed and say, get up and walk, and they do, right? So proof of your ability would be readily evident. Verse 24, 25, Jesus says, but I want you to know, I can do one, I can do the other, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. If Jesus said your sins are forgiven, and that's all he did, then those watching would never really know if he could forgive sin or if his sins had been forgiven, right? So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately. Okay, that's the, and this again is talking about forgiveness of sins too. If he can do one or another, immediately he stood up. Immediately his sins are removed. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. I mean, could you imagine that? His friends looking down from the roof through the hole, watching him, watching all this, listening to this, right? The crowd, speechless, stunned. Because Jesus knew what they were thinking, and Jesus said, listen, if I can do one, I can do the other. And they are absolutely amazed. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Wow. And that brings us to our third word. And that's the word fear. Look at it, verse 26. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with, look at that next word, awe. They were filled with awe. That word awe there is phobos in the Greek. It's where we get our word phobia or fear from, 
They were paralyzed with fear. Because suddenly they knew they were in the presence of God. All of a sudden, if I can do one, I can do the other. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Get up. And he gets up. They knew he was forgiven. Who can forgive sins but God alone? All of a sudden they realize they're in the presence of God. Here's God. And they, they, they were paralyzed for fear. It, it's interesting to, to, that at the start of the story, there was one man who was paralyzed. He's forgiven. He's saved. But now the crowd is paralyzed. They're paralyzed with awe. With absolute awe. Jesus can heal. Jesus can forgive. That was the message. Message received. And they, and, and they may not have understood the incarnation, which is like the second person of the Godhead Trinity coming and putting on flesh, right? And uh, all that that entails. And, and they may not have understood everything about it, but you can be sure that the awe there is not just a, wow, that's cool, right? But an awe that borders on fear. It's the word phobos in the Greek. It borders on fear, you know, and, and that word would be used throughout the gospel account. We're going to see it lots. You know, when Jesus walks on the water, they're filled with awe. Same word. They're filled with fear. Who, he walks on water, right? When he stills the storm, they are filled with awe, fear. They're saying, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Nature obeys him. Creation obeys him. Luke 7, when he raises the widow's son from the dead, the town is scared to death. In Mark chapter 5, when Jesus heals the gathering demoniac, the town is so afraid of him, they beg him to leave. They're afraid. They beg Jesus, get out of here. Like, who, what in the world? They're afraid. Because, I mean, you're suddenly aware you're dealing with God, and it blew their mind. It blew their mind. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Wow. We have seen. We know now Jesus is God and he can forgive sins. And only God can forgive sins. There's no other way to have your sins removed but through Jesus Christ. And he demonstrates that here in this story. Now there were three groups of people in that room, as we're wrapping up, there were three groups of people in that room. First, there were the forgiven. There were those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that paralyzed man, but you better believe there was other people there that had put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they knew who he was, maybe not fully, but they trusted in him and they put their faith in Jesus and they were saved. They got that eternal miracle. Praise God. They're really excited today that they did that. Then there were those who were not forgiven. There were those who were furious, right? They got upset over this. The religious leaders, of all people, the religious leaders were mad. Maybe you've met people like that, angry that there's somebody who talks about sin. They don't want to hear about sin. They just want to do what they want to do. Every time you mention God or Jesus, the conversation leans that way. You can see them. They get angry, right? They're, they're furious, and then there were, third, there were the fickle. Those who just can't decide. Or those who wouldn't make a decision. And let me just sell, tell you, to not decide is to decide. To not make a decision is to make a decision. And those same three groups of people are here today. And Christ Jesus offers you and I forgiveness and it's the kind of forgiveness that blots out every sin, washes it all away and when God forgives you, he doesn't remember it anymore. No matter what you've done, it's no longer held against you. Literally, it's dismissed be your sins. Yeah. Hallelujah. And there's some of you here and you're thinking you're going to make yourself good enough to come to God but the fact of the matter is you will never be able to do that. None of us can do that. That's why he came. But if you'll come to Jesus and you'll put your faith in him to save you, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. The heavenly father will forgive you. 
And when he forgives you, he won't be able to think about it anymore. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Would you bow your head and pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you for your forgiveness. Oh, we pray, Father, that this morning you touch every single heart in this place, Lord. Christians who need forgiveness, people who have not yet made a commitment to you who need forgiveness, your forgiveness, Lord. But Lord, there's not a, a person in this room who doesn't need your forgiveness. Lord, and I, I pray that you would speak to us in this moment, forgiving, touching hearts, bringing healing to wounded spirits. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask, is there somebody here who would like to receive that eternal miracle today? You're here and you say, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. Who can forgive sin but God alone? Only God can forgive. Only Jesus can forgive sin. We can't earn it. We can't do it through good deeds. We can't clean ourselves up. We come to Jesus and he, he forgives us. And he removes our sin. If you're here, every head bowed and eyes closed, you want to make that personal decision.